why don't we get started? Let me excuse, uh, excuse me for interrupting your lunches, but you can keep eating quietly. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to What Matters in Me, uh, to Me and Why at UC Irvine. Uh, I'm Jonathan Fung in the uh, physics department and one of the co-organizers. And uh, I can safely say that this has been a spectacular series. It's now in its third season. We've had wonderful speakers and I'm going to have another one today. Uh, let me just first introduce the series, though. The idea here is that this is not a typical uh, academic speaker series that you would get on the UCI campus. Uh, in this series, we ask faculty and staff members to just talk about basically what matters to them and why. And so this takes them wherever they want to go, and that's the best way to do it. It's often a fascinating journey. And um, they'll talk typically for about 20, 30 minutes, um, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers when you can ask questions as well. Uh, in these talks, we've had people talk about um, their motivations, you know, what makes them do what they do, how do they um, see themselves as part of the UCI community, what are their motivations, what are their beliefs, what are their core values, whatever it is, and uh, I think you'll find them pretty interesting. There are a couple of housekeeping things I need to get out of the way. First, we do have lunches. Please pack them up and clean up after yourself as we're, as we're finishing. There are restrooms out that door and to the right if you need them. This talk is being videoed, and so if you don't want to appear in the video, uh, you shouldn't sit too next to a camera, which I guess <laughs> there's one right there, so you can move back um, quietly if you want. And then finally, on the way in, you probably received a questionnaire. Those uh, we collect and read very carefully, uh, both for your suggestions for future speakers and for your just simply comments about the speaker series. And so I encourage you to really take some time, fill those in before you leave, please. I think that's it. So um, since this is a wonderful opportunity, we have students, we have faculty members, we have staff all mixing together. We've now had a tradition where we invite everyone to just talk to their neighbor uh, for just a few minutes just to see who is sitting next to you. And then after that, I'll invite John Stupar, who's from the School of Engineering and also an organizer, to extremely rudely interrupt your fascinating conversations <laughs> and uh, get us started with the speaker introduction. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll have to interrupt your uh, meeting and. Uh, I'm so glad, though, that you really partake of the discussion time. This is, this is really a warmer, uh, warmer upper to our, our program. Well, as a founding member of the organizing committee, I'm uh, really honored to have the job of introducing our, our speaker. Um, she's actually a fellow alum of Claremont Graduate University, where uh, I also went. And uh, uh, it's Natalie Schoenfeld. And she's actually our 16th speaker here in the uh, What Matters to Me and Why series. And uh, on campus, she's the Director of Student Transition Services in the Division of Undergraduate Education. And though she first came to UCI at the very tender age of one, <laughs> she's only been working here full time for the past 16 years. Her work focuses on advocating for first generation, low income, transfer, and other historically underserved students. And she provides services that support their engagement success uh, here at UCI. Natalie's interest in issues of diversity and access and success for students are evident in the work she does and in her past academic course of study. As an undergraduate, she studied issues of voice and power in French literature and political philosophy. Sounds interesting. And in her master's program, she studied the notion of equality as understood and even misunderstood through the affirmative action. And we all know what that is as well. It would be interesting to hear your comments on that. And in her PhD at Claremont, she studied the ways in which culture and the ability to negotiate culture shape student success in higher education, which is what she's really doing here. Natalie is the oldest daughter of two incredible parents, 
I hope you talk about them. Yes. <laughs> she still lives here within five miles of her nuclear family and enjoys being a parent of two near teens and the partner to a surfing IT professional. And uh, with that, I sincerely have to say we're eager to hear what matters to her and why. So uh, for those of us who celebrate life and liberty and pursuit of happiness, <laughs> let's give uh, a warm anteater welcome to Natalie Schoenfeld. Thank you. I don't know if I'm on, but we're going to try and have me on in multiple places. Can you hear me from here? OK, excellent. So I wanted to start just by saying thank you. I really appreciate being asked to do this. It's, it's both overwhelming and thrilling all at the same time. Um, the, you know, A couple of weeks ago, when I really started thinking about doing this, I found myself constantly thinking about, what matters to me? Why does this matter to me? Um, and how will I communicate this in a way that even sounds remotely intelligent to other people? So my hope is that I will do those things for you today. Um, I look forward to the questions that you'll ask at the end. Ultimately, really what I want is to be able to talk about these things, right? I think all of us have things that are really important and meaningful to us. And so it's always exciting for me personally to learn what those things are for other people. So what I wanted to do to just to start off is just to say that growing up as a child, um, my parents and my family told me lots of stories and lots of sayings. And so really those were really central to the things that I learned and the things that were important to me. And my, my mother, both my parents actually I should say, both my parents are here and my husband is here in the room. So if you notice me sort of looking in one direction, you'll be able to guess where they are. Um, but my, my mother is Spanish and there are lots of sayings that people say in Spain and my mother always as a child would tell me those things at different times as ways to teach me and instruct me and make me reflect on different things. Um, and one of the things that my mother told me from the time I was a child um, all the way up until last week, which has really been a saying that's been critical in my life, is um, dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. And what that means is tell me who you walk with and I will tell you who you are. And for me, that saying has been so powerful because at different times in my life, it's meant different things. But it's really caused me to think about who am I with and what am I doing? And what do those things say about me? And do they say the things I want them to say about me? Um, so I'm going to use that sort of as my way to talk about what's, what matters to me and why and talk about different people who have been part of my life and who I've walked with and how those people are important to me and their stories are important to who I am. So the first thing I should tell you is that I am a naturally curious person. I ask lots of questions, and people who know me well know that about me. Um, at different times, even folks have said, you ask too many questions, but I just I can't help it. So um, I think in large part, my curiosity comes from my parents. So you know, my parents are um, they're very different people. And throughout my life, always what I knew was that there were lots of contrasts and differences in terms of my parents. So why do I say that? So my parents grew up in different countries, are of different faiths, uh, grew up speaking different languages. And so all of their life experiences until they met one another are fundamentally different. And so as a child growing up, there would be all kinds of things that would happen in our household. And each of them would share their different perspective based on their life or their language, or their religion in terms of ways to understand that specific thing. Um, and so for me, I, I always knew that as a child. I always saw these contrasts. And I always thought they were really interesting. And so I asked lots of questions about those. But the other thing that I learned through that was that contrast and difference was good. Um, and so I never grew up as a child thinking, oh, you know, difference is bad. I actually saw difference as a way to connect people and make things more interesting. Um, and so that has really been a critical sort of concept for me. I'm always interested in learning about how people are different from each other and how people connect those differences. Um, and I really, you know, attribute my parents teaching that to me and that being so important to me. So I was um, born in New Jersey. 
I am the oldest of two children, which John shared as part of my introduction. Um, 14 months after my birth, my sister came along. And this was a joyous, momentous occasion for all of us. Um, and then shortly after that, my family moved to Irvine. So that's why you know, in the introduction we talked about, you know, I've been here since I was a year old. So my folks moved to, the, to Irvine in 1970. My father came here as a faculty member then. Um, and so Irvine has always been home base. Um, not necessarily a place that I always considered home, but always been home base. Um, and I'll explain that more. Um, so even though we lived in Irvine or came to Irvine when I was a year old, I actually, um, as a child, grew up moving between the United States, France, and Spain. Um, and so as a child, my experience was constantly moving through these three different countries. And I realize folks in the room may have been to those places today. Um, I can tell you that in the 70s, the differences between those countries were fairly significant. Um, and so as a child growing up, I would move literally from one place to another. And if any of you have children, you know memories are sort of temporary, right? So when we were in one place, that's where we were. And then we'd move to the next place. And sometimes I'd forget what the previous place had been. Um, like the, the piece for me about moving that way as a child is that I always felt like wherever I was, that's where I was. That was the only culture, the only language, the only society I knew. Um, I always knew as we moved that I was American, but I didn't necessarily ever know what being American actually meant. Um, and really don't think I figured that out until much later, starting in my adolescence. So I wanted to start by sharing sort of two stories about from my childhood that for me are really sort of instructive and memorable. So the first story I want to share is the second time we moved to France. So um, my parents, we moved to France when I was seven years old, and it was the second time we were moving there. And at that point, I, you know, my sister and I, neither of us spoke any French whatsoever. We'd forgotten everything we'd learned before. Um, my parents' approach in terms of our moving was that moving and change, all those things were totally normal. Um, so we went to public school. We, you know, we lived among French people. <laughs> and I, you know, I have this very clear memory of my parents taking us to school that first day. And what I remember is standing in the school courtyard um, and my father pointing to this woman in the distance and said, do you see that woman over there? And we said, yes. And he said, she's the only person at the school who speaks English. He said, she will, if you have any questions, she will answer any question you have, but only for two weeks. And then after that, she won't speak English anymore. And, um, and I remember my father telling us this and us you know, looking, making sure we you know, would recognize her. And not feeling nervous or worried that we only had two weeks, potentially, that we could ask this woman any question that we had in English. Just sort of, oh, good to know. Here's this resource for us. And then just moving right along. In fact, I have no memory whatsoever of how I learned French, ever struggling learning French, ever struggling adjusting. We just were. So uh, my experience was you move. You immerse yourself in what's around you, and then you become part of that, period. And so that was, that was how, we, how we did that experience. Um, the second memory I wanted to share with you was from living in Spain. So I shared earlier that my mother is Spanish. And um, as a child, we would go to Spain often for the summers and holidays to be with my family. Um, and when I was, a little before I was 10, we actually moved to Spain. And it's the only time I ever lived in Spain. Um, we lived there for about nine months. And what I remember in terms of living in Spain was actually going to the American base outside of Madrid. So uh, my grandfather uh, was a medic in World War II, yes, roughly. And my, so my grandmother had a card to, that would allow her to enter the military base outside of Madrid. And there are lots of military bases in Spain, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, and so my father was able to secure a card to the military base. And he would take my sister and I regularly to the military base outside of Madrid. And I thought at the time he was doing that as a way to sort of teach us what it meant to be American and sort of expose us to American things. 
Um, what I realized later was we were going some for that, but also because we were shipping all of our things back to the United States, and it's easier to ship through the military than through General Postal Service. Um, so, but there are two core things that I remember from visiting the military base. So one of those things was the mailboxes. And some of these things may seem really, you know, sort of unimportant, but one of the things for me was I didn't know what an American mailbox looked like. And I remember passing by this sort of blue box and my dad saying, that's a mailbox. I was like, really, that's a mailbox? Because in Spain, most of the mailboxes were in the shapes of lines, and you opened the mouth and you dropped your letter in the mailbox, which as a child was a very exciting thing to do, right, compared to opening a blue box to drop a card in. So I thought that seemed pretty boring. Um, the other thing I remember is my father would take us through the cafeteria at the military base. And some of that was sort of exposure you know, to different foods and other things. And at one point, one day, we were, you know, we were going through the line. And I don't even remember what my father drank. But we passed by sort of this soda machine. And he drank something. And then he went back to refill it. And my sister and I were like, what are you doing? You can't do that. You're, you're stealing. And he said, no, no. In America, there's this thing, free refills, right? Like, you buy a drink. And it, once you buy the drink, they refill your beverage. We said, really? Why would they do that? Why would anyone do it? Like, it just didn't make any sense to us economically or anything else. Why would people do that, right? And so I have this very clear memory of that. And every time I pass by Soda Machine, I always think about that. Because my instinct is never to refill, right? And every time I do, I feel like somehow I'm, I'm getting over the system because I never had that experience right as a child until I saw those machines at the military base. But both of those experiences for me were really important in terms of m making me realize that as much as I was American, I had no idea what being American was. So other people knew I was American, and I had an American passport, and I knew that that was my national identity, but I had no idea what that meant, culturally or otherwise. Um, and it actually took me quite a long time to figure out what that meant. And I struggled quite a bit with what did it mean to be American and who was I really culturally. So certainly as a teenager, um, I always felt like I was at my core French. There is no one in my family who is French. And I still feel this very strong allegiance to France and to French people, but the truth is, no one in my family is French. Um, but I know that I have that because I grew up in that environment, and we were 100% immersed in that. And so as far as really I knew day to day, I was just another French child living in France. So we moved, so we moved to the United States. Um, we moved back to the United States from Spain. Um, and so I spent my adolescence, for the most part, in the United States and primarily in Irvine. Um, and I was not necessarily very happy about that. Um, but I will say that there were some really important things that happened to me when I was in high school um, and as an adolescent in Irvine that really became sort of pivotal experiences for me. So I'm going to share a couple of those with you. So the first, the first one was um, the hiring of a faculty member at UCI. So I don't know if there are folks in the room here from social sciences, but uh, my father's a professor in political science. And when I was a teenager, a faculty member by the name of David Easton was hired to come work at UCI. Um, and David and his wife, Sylvia, became basically the closest thing to grandparents I had as an adolescent. So I grew up right in California, moving around to France and to Spain. My, I had one grandparent who lived in New York. My other grandmother, grandparents lived in Spain. And so for the most part, I saw my grandparents once a year for a week you don't really build a relationship that way. Um, but when the Eastons came to UCI, they lived four houses down. And they were basically the age of grandparents. And so they became, in many ways, my sisters and my grandparents. Um, and the thing about the Eastons is they were really a phenomenal couple. So um, David was this amazing man in that he could sit down with any person and find something interesting to talk about with them. Um, so when you spent time with David, you felt like you were such an interesting person. And he was such an interesting person to talk to, 
right? Um, and that was, you know, I, I think about him often. He passed away this summer, and, and I was very sad when he passed away. My husband will remember because we were on vacation. Um, and, you know, the thing I always think about when I interact with people is I hope I can make people feel the way David made me feel as a teenager, um, that I had important and interesting things to say that we could talk about that were meaningful. Um, but David did that for me. Um, the other person, right, is Sylvia. And so um, Sylvia Easton was this amazing woman who um, looked fairly unassuming. And then you would start talking to her and you realized, oh, there's a lot more to this woman than initially appears to be the case. Um, I think of Sylvia as really the first and maybe only real revolutionary person I've ever met. Um, she... Um, she stopped purchasing clothes in the 70s, so she just looked like this hippie, sweet, peaceful, <laughs> loving woman. Um, she had all kinds of you know, issues and agendas about how to make the world a better place. Um, and she would do it sort of in these very interesting, unassuming ways. So the way it would work with my sister and I is that she would at different times you know, talk about different issues, or she would say things like, so Natalie, do you think all people deserve to be treated with dignity? And I would say, yeah, I think so. She's like, that's good. So um, let me tell you about what's going on at this homeless shelter in Santa Ana. And she would tell me you know, different stories of work that she was doing. So the homeless shelter story that I think about is she would tell me how at the homeless shelter they would, they would provide food to people. And 15 minutes after they'd provided them with food, they would scurry them out of the shelter. And she's, she would say, do you think that's a dignified way to treat people? That they only have 15 minutes to eat and then they're forced out to move on? And I'd say, no, I, I don't think it is. And she said, yeah, I don't either. And so she would share examples like that with me all the time, whether it was about um, who's homeless and who isn't. Um, you know, one of the things that I think about this a lot now, she would say to me, do you know that... Um, most people who are in prisons have mental health issues. Do you know about that? I said, no, I had no idea. She said, do you, do you think that if someone has a mental health issue that they can really have committed a crime that would lead to imprisonment? I, I don't know, Sylvia. And she would say, I, I think that's an important thing to think about, right? Or um, she would tell me about there are two prisons in Orange County, if, if you don't know, in the city of Orange. There's a women's state facility and a, and a men's state facility. And um, the women's state facility is, um, the, the level of security is much higher than the men's facility. And so the women in, in the women's facility often in the you know, early 80s would be held in shackles. And she would say, do, do you know that's going on at this facility? And I'd say, no. And she said, well, do, do you think people should do something about that? And I would think, well, yeah. But not me, right? <laughs> like, yeah, someone should do something, but, but not me. Um, and part of it was because she would tell me these things, and I thought, this is horrible. These things are absolutely horrible. And she would say it with this really sweet, loving voice, which sort of served as this contrast to all these injustices that she would inform me about regularly. And I thought, Sylvia, I don't know what to do with any of this. I don't know that I can do anything, right? Um, she always felt like she could do something, which was always really inspiring and sort of this great source of humor, right? David would go away for conferences and would say to Sylvia, like, please do not invite a homeless family to live in our house, or please stop writing to the letters to the LA Times to expose these injustices, right? Because she would, she would write letters about all these things going on and would have different names so that they would print her letters, right? So that they didn't just see her name and say, no more of this. But so anyway, so David and Sylvia were really important to me in terms of teaching me about really thinking about dignity and what my responsibility was or my role was in treating people with dignity um, and really thinking about how I engage with people in you know, loving and respectful ways. Um, and I think about both of them all the time, actually. Um, the, the other story I want to share with you, I, I'm calling my Irma Bombeck story. So um, I don't know how many people know who Irma Bombeck is, but she used to write um, a column in the LA Times. 
I love Irma Bombeck. So she'd write these short little pieces about things that seemed seemingly unimportant, was really funny, and there'd be something really insightful every time she wrote. Um, and I remember as a teenager having a conversation with my mom one day um, where, I, where I asked my mom, I said, do you think I can have a family and have a career? And my mom paused and said, I don't know. You know, I, I, I wasn't ever able to do both. I don't know. Um, and when she told me that, I, I felt devastated, right? Um, because I wanted to have both. And I was starting to think, I don't know how this is done. I, don't, I, I haven't seen this. I, I don't know how to do this and how to start thinking about having both a family and a profession. And so, you know, my mom said that I thought, okay, I, I have to figure out some way to have both. And so I said, okay, I'm going to be like Irma Bombeck. I'm going to write a column because I knew from her column she had a family. So I was like, well, somehow she's figured out how to do it. So maybe if I'm at home and I write, then I can have a family and I can have a career. Um, but, but that was really pivotal for me also, having that conversation with my mom and, and finding myself in a position as a teenager starting to think, what can I do and, and how will you know, being a woman impact um, what I'm able to do, what others will allow me to do, what I will allow myself to do, and you know, how to manage all of that. Um, the other story I want to share from my adolescence was about Richard Nixon. So um, at UCI in the early 80s, there was the potential for the Nixon Library to be housed here at UCI, and I don't know how many folks know that. Um, when I was in high school, I was sort of strangely obsessed with Nixon and Watergate. And every opportunity I got to write papers about Nixon and Watergate, I took. Um, so, the Nix so there was talks about the Nixon Library being here at UCI, and there was some controversy because the Watergate tapes would be not prominently displayed as part of the library. And students were meeting to talk about you know, the Nixon Library. And so my father invited me to be able to come and just listen to these conversations. And for me, as a teenager, it was really exciting to be part of these conversations, to hear people talking about how they felt about this, what they thought was right, um, their own sort of desire to sort of fight the system and the university and make sure that if the library was here, you know, people would have access to those tapes. Um, and so for me, that was really my first experience where I saw the power of a group, right? The ability of people to come together around a common cause and sort of fight the system or change the system. Um, and so that was a really important and powerful experience I had in high school. So after that, I went to Pomona College, Claremont Colleges. I was very excited to leave Irvine, very excited to leave high school. Um, Super excited about going to Pomona. I thought this was going to be the greatest place ever. Um, and it wasn't. Um, at least it wasn't initially. So uh, Pomona College is a small liberal arts college about an hour away from here. Um, I, you know, I felt as prepared as anyone could be for college. My father is a faculty member. Uh, my grandmother, who I'll talk about in a bit, was a high school guidance counselor, helped people go to college. So I felt like I knew what this whole thing was about. I was meant to go to college. So I, you know, I show up at Pomona and I realize, oh, this is not going to be as easy as I thought it was going to be. Um, and what I found was that academically I was fine, but socially I was completely unprepared for the realities of attending Pomona. So there were a couple things that were really difficult for me about Pomona. The first was dealing with wealth. So I grew up in a middle class family, certainly had all the resources I could possibly ever need. Uh, the level of wealth that I experienced and witnessed at Pomona was beyond anything I'd ever known in terms of old money. Um, the way people thought about resources, the way people thought about what was owed to them and what they could do was very different. Um, I was the only person on my floor who didn't have an allowance. Um, there was a woman on my floor who literally would order hundreds and hundreds of dollars of clothing from L.L. Bean and J. Crew. Her family uh, rented a car for her for the whole four years she was an undergrad because they didn't want her to have to deal with the responsibility of car maintenance, right? So, you know, the wealth was overwhelming. Um, and, and managing what that meant in terms of how people think about the world and what the world owes them and they owe the world was, was really difficult. 
Um, the other piece about Pomona that, that I struggled with, and I didn't have a name for it then, but I do now, really is the rape culture of the campus. So when I went to Pomona College, there was this thing called the lookbook. Maybe you remember that, Doug. <laughs> so the lookbook is sort of like the, the old school version of Facebook. And what happened was, that, you know, as part of admissions, they would collect pictures of every incoming freshman, put them in a book, and then you would come as a freshman and they would give you this thing called the lookbook, sort of like a yearbook, right? But at Pomona, returning students would basically find ways to get copies of the lookbook so they could check out the freshman class coming in. And people actually called women in the freshman class fresh meat. So not fresh men, fresh meat. Um, and that was a little shocking for me, to put it mildly. Um, so, you know, that was sort of my first entree into sort of, you know, being in an environment that I think, you know, degraded women in, in such an open way. Um, the, other, the other thing that happened was a close friend of mine my freshman year was raped. So I went to school in the, in the late 80s, and in the late 80s is when people started talking about date rape. So, you know, the date rape was really complicated for people because the images people talked about in terms of rape was you're walking down the street, someone jumps out of a bush with a knife, they pull you, and then you get raped. Well, date rape didn't look anything like that, and so people didn't know if that should be called rape or not or what it was. It just was something that wasn't quite right. Um, and so, so my freshman year, a close friend of mine was, um, I should say, allegedly raped by a gentleman at one of the other Claremont colleges. She pressed charges. Um, the hearing didn't go really the way anyone anticipated it would go. Certainly none of us did. Basically, the, the charges were thrown out because she had met him at a party and there was alcohol. And so there were questions in terms of had she welcomed his advances or not. Um, that experience my freshman year really shaped me in lots of ways. And so the next year I became what existed at, at Pomona was a sponsor. Um, students were hired as volunteers and would basically serve as mentors and role models for incoming first year students. So I was a sponsor and I decided as a sponsor the first thing I was going to do was talk with the women on my floor about date rape. Um, and everyone thought I was crazy. It was like people are just moving in and you're going to talk to them about date rape? And I said, yeah, absolutely. because. They're probably going to go to a party tonight, and, and I'm really scared about what might happen. And if something happens to them and I haven't said anything, then I've sort of screwed up before we've even started. So, uh, so my students moved in, and literally within three hours, I you know, had this whole conversation about date rape. They weren't super happy with me they were doing that. Um, but as part of that, because I was you know, 18 and somewhat obnoxious, you know, I said, look, this, this happened to a close friend of mine, the person who did it. Here's his name. You're probably going to meet him. He plays football. If he starts talking to you, turn around and walk the other way. And so they said, oh, OK, all right. So and most people knew how I felt about him and what had happened to my friend. So later my sophomore year, there was this incident that happened at Pomona. Actually, it happened at all the Claremont colleges. And I checked this morning. You can actually still find it online, which I find fascinating. Um, so I woke up one morning, and there were posters plastered all over the five colleges. And they said, warning, Claremont College's rapist, his name, and a picture of him. Um, and hundreds of these. And this is back in the day when literally you'd have to sort of put tape on a window. I mean, so it took a lot of time, and there were hundreds of these, I mean, everywhere, all over every window of every dining hall, on walkways, everywhere. So, um, so this incident happened, and because I'd been so vocal about how I felt about him, um, you know, I got called into the, the dean of students' office, basically, is, were you involved in this? And, and I said, no, I wasn't. And the truth is, I wasn't. I wish I had been, but <laughs> I wasn't, right? Um, but what I learned from that, so that was my first sort of exposure to vigilante justice, right? And, and the campuses just freaked out over this whole incident. People talked about, oh, you can't, you can't say someone's guilty without a hearing, and how unfair, and oh, this poor guy, and his life has been ruined. And I'm thinking, him? What about all the women he's assaulted? Like, why is no one paying attention to them? Anyways, what happened through that experience was really interesting. He ended up getting expelled from the colleges. 
Um, and the colleges changed all their policies around date rape, right, which I thought was fantastic. And what I learned from that is that as much as I like to play by the system, sometimes you have to go against the system to make things happen because sometimes the system isn't ready to deal with some of the inequalities that are happening. So while my preference certainly is not to do that, I do really believe in the power of groups. And I saw how a group of unknown women who I think are incredible, right, courageously went, posted up flyers all over the campuses, got people talking about date rape, got people thinking about what was going on, and were able to change policies in ways that were really important and meaningful. So that was really a huge experience for me at Pomona. So I know I said I was going to talk a little bit about my grandmother. So uh, my grandmother was probably the most important person for me um, in my undergrad. Um, the reason I say that is that you know both my parents went to college in some ways and in, in non-traditional ways. And I come from a family where lots of people go to college. Um, but my grandmother was the only person really who I knew who had a really traditional college experience, right? She lived in the res halls. Um, you know, she had this whole experience that looked like mine. Um, and so when I went to college, I, you know, she and I, um, we would talk every week and there were all these things that just I couldn't wrap my head around. I couldn't figure out how to get enough sleep. I couldn't figure out how to eat in the dining hall. I couldn't figure out how to deal with all the people because I wanted to socialize, but I still needed to study. I just couldn't figure out those things. And so um, I talked with my grandmother every week, and she'd give me advice and suggestions, and then she'd send me cards, and sometimes she'd send me money so I could go eat off campus and not have to eat in the dining hall. Um, but one time, my grandmother called, unbeknownst to me. I wasn't there and ended up talking with my roommate. And so the story for me of my grandmother was that after that, one time my grandmother called and my roommate said, oh, is that your grandmother on the phone? I said, yeah. She said, can I talk to her after you're done? And I was like, yeah? Why do you want to talk to my grandmother, right? And she was like, oh, she gave me some great advice. So my grandmother ended up being a support for me and for other people because she had experienced sort of this traditional college experience and, and could give us some insight and perspective. And what I realized from that was how important it is to do that for people, right? That sometimes you go through things and it can look like everyone should know how to do this, but the truth is that most people don't the first time around, right? And it doesn't hurt to give people assistance along the way because someone probably helped you too that first time. So my grandmother was really important to me in that way and that I really think my freshman year would have been a complete just obliterated mess if it weren't for her. She really sort of carried me through that. All right, so the last thing that happened when I was an undergrad was a woman by the name of Jen Perkins was hired to work at Pomona College. And the reason why this was so important was up until that time, basically every person I worked with, interacted with at the college was a faculty member. So my sense of higher education was if you want to work in higher education, you need to be a faculty member. There are no other jobs. So I thought, okay, well, I think I want to work in higher ed, so I guess I need to get a PhD and teach. And then they hired this woman, Jen, and she was just an administrator. I say just. She didn't have to teach, right? She, she worked directly with students. And at that point, I thought, oh my god, I could do this. I could have a job like Jen. I could just work on a college campus and work with students. I don't have to be a faculty member to work with students. Um, so that completely changed my path for me in terms of what I wanted to do professionally when she was hired because I, I learned that I could, do work, I could work on a college campus without being a faculty member. And I, I hadn't realized that before she was hired. So the year after I graduated, I started applying for all kinds of jobs. And I got lots of interviews, but I got no jobs. And um, what people told me when I applied for jobs was they said, we really like you but we think you'll rock the boat. We don't need anyone to rock the boat. So, you know, thank you, right? My husband sometimes refers to me as the straw that stirs the drink, so that's sort of my rocking the boat element. Um, so, you know, I kept getting this feedback as I go to different interviews, and the way I translated it was I said, oh, I need more crisis management experience, because I clearly wasn't ready to hear that I would rock the boat. 
So um, I went and actually looked for a counseling job because I thought, well, maybe it's because I went to sort of this non-typical sort of college in terms of the way things were done, and so I need to build these counseling skills. And I ended up working in a group home, and I don't know how many folks know what a group home is, but um, kids who are in foster care, if they're not successful in foster care, end up getting placed sometimes in what's called a group home, which is basically a home with you know six to eight kids who live in the house, and then there are staff who come and staff that house 24 hours a day, and it sort of operates like a home. Some might say it operates like a prison, somewhere in between the two. Um, so I worked, I worked in this group home for a year. Um, and, it, you know, working in that group home was one of the most important experiences of my life. Um, when I first went in, I thought, oh, I'm going to do this great work. I'm going to save these kids, right? Um, and the kids in less, you know, more colorful language than this basically said, we don't need you. We don't need a savior, you know? If you want to go save someone, go somewhere else, because we don't need you to save us. And the experience of that really made me think about, you know, how patronizing it can be to say, oh, I'm doing this because people need me, right? Versus really thinking about, maybe I'm doing this because I need this, right? Versus they need it, or I do this because I think this is the right thing to do. So that experience in the group home really made me think about, Am I doing this because I think people need me, or is it because I need them? And needing to be really clear about that, because my goal certainly wasn't to be patronizing, but I know that's how the kids in the house experienced it, and they told me that very clearly. Um, and what I realized over you know, the nine months that I worked in that group home was those kids were bright and had dreams and had been handed a really horrible deal. And my job was really just to help move them along on their pathway to independence. I didn't have to like the way they were going or where they were going, um, but that was what I was supposed to do. Um, and to you know, sympathize or empathize or pity them didn't help them at all. And it certainly didn't help me either. So I, I really had to move past that. The other thing that happened for me, am I running out of time? I am. Oh, OK, I'll stop there. No, no, like yeah. Oh, okay. So the other thing I'll just say really quickly is I met my husband working at the group home. So he wasn't in a group home. He worked in another group home. <laughs> and that was how we met. So that was the other perk for me of working in the group home was that's, that was where we met. Um, I think the other thing I'll tell you is how I came to UCI. So I told you I, you know, I couldn't get a job, right, rocking the boat. And so um, I talked to my father and I said, okay, I need to talk to people who do this kind of work. So my dad put me in touch with Sally Peterson, who is then the Dean of Students here at UCI. I met with her and she actually said to me, you know, there's this guy I think you should meet. His name is Jim Craig. And, um, and I said, oh, okay. Um, he works in housing. And I was like, what's housing? Because where I went to school, everyone lived on campus. So it wasn't called housing, it was called campus life. So that didn't make any sense to me. Um, and so I ended up meeting this man, Jim Craig, who we lovingly call the man with the ponytail. He doesn't have one anymore. And um, I met him, and he told me about what he was doing in housing, and he told me about this program that he was involved in called Sierra um, that you know, was this residential community where students would get together twice a week and have conversations about identity and diversity and conflict and community. And I thought, that's fantastic. So he and I literally started meeting every you know, two, three months from that day forward. Um, and is the reason why I came to UCI eight years after I met him was I thought, I want to work at this place. I want to work for this person who is creating these spaces for people, right? Where people can have these kinds of conversations, where there's a value on the group. Um, all of that was really important to me. And, and that's really ultimately what led me to UCI. Um, I, I apologize for going over. I do really want to hear what you all have to say. I will just encourage all of you really think about, I think the saying, dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres is a really powerful one. I'd encourage you all to think about who are the people that you walk with and what does that say about you and who you are. Um, I think you'll find that a really rewarding experience. I know I, know I personally have. So thank you very much.
because I already have my phone, I guess I'll ask a question. Um, do you think your earlier, obviously you don't work in state rate right now, but I do you think your earlier experiences uh, with your neighbor and uh, uh, the experience in college with uh, this, uh, the date rate incident, do you think that's influenced your current, what your current occupation is at UCI? I think it's influenced how I do work at UCI. And that I think um, I really value the group. I, I want to make sure that people have a say in what they do. Um, and I, I think that it's also made me really think about when something happens and someone says they've been wronged, right, that I really need to listen to that that they may not know how to communicate how they've been wronged in a way that works in the system, right? Um, they may have been wronged and done some wrong things, but it doesn't negate that they've been wronged, right? Um, yeah, so in that way, I think it really has. Yeah. Natalie, what made you pursue your PhD? I, I pursued my PhD because I went to a presentation when I worked at Chapman on cyberbullying. And the woman who did the presentation, it was right at the beginning of technology, and she was talking about the way in which people interacted with each other and the way technology was changing that. And I thought the work she was doing was really interesting. Um, but what I thought was, I don't, I don't have the skills to be able to do that work. And so I decided literally that day, like, I wanted to get a PhD so that I would develop the skills I needed so that if something came up that I really wanted to study, I could legitimately do that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's why I went into the PhD program. It was not very planned at all. <laughs> My undergrad is the only thing I planned. Why Oh, because I wanted to work full time. So um, I never, I, I couldn't imagine going to school full time. I, I wanted to work full time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you find yourself asking your own children sort of thought-provoking questions? Like here? I do. I do. And they ask me very thought-provoking questions too. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, I think, you know, my children are really fortunate, right? They, they have their grandparents nearby. They have my husband and I. They have this huge support network that, that I didn't have as a child the way they do. And my sister lives in Tustin. She has three kids. So they have this huge network that I never had, right? Um, and I think that we are all so different. We're all very talkative. We all share lots of stories. And so they ask lots of questions. Yeah. I'm a grad student here and a TA, so I was wondering if you had any advice how I can use my role to encourage students, and especially those who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Yeah. You know, I think, I don't know that my advice would be any different than I would give for, for any other student. So, you know, one of the things I think over time that I've appreciated most about having gone to a place like Pomona <laughs> is that it doesn't it's not OK to be invisible. At, at, when you go to school with 1,200 students, everyone gets noticed. I think at a place like UCI, sometimes it's easy for people to feel like they're not noticed, and that there's so much power in noticing someone, in acknowledging that they're in the room. Um, so I think sometimes just say, just checking in with students and letting them know that they matter is the most important thing you can do. Um, and then the other thing I think is just not assuming that all the things you know, they know, right? There was a time when you didn't know those, but you probably pretended like you knew them, right? Someone said something, you went, oh, mm-hmm, and then you were like, okay, I got to find out what that means, right? <laughs> to, not, to not do that, right? Or to as often as possible say, oh, here's this thing I'm telling you about. I had no idea what that meant the first time I heard it, and then I learned this. And so it's a way to tell people without outing anyone for not knowing something. So I think those things are really important to do. Yeah. Can you speak a little on, on navigating being a career woman and mother and wife? I can. 
Um, I think that's the hardest thing. Um, I feel really fortunate in that, you know, uh, my my husband has, you know, accepted me for who I am. So, you know, when when he met me, I was working three jobs. I had Pepto Bismol in every location. I had a bottle in my car, in my bag at work. You know, and we joke because he said at the time he thought she doesn't have time to see anyone. Um, and you know, I've always loved to work, and I love being with my kids. I, I can be a little intense about all these things, but it's been you know really important to be able to, you know, be able to do these things and have someone who helps me do them. Um, but I think the reality too is that there, you know, it's not about balance. It's always about sacrifice. I think balance is unreal, right? You know, I mean, I, I'm with my kids and when I'm with them, I'm with them and that's great. But all the other times I'm sacrificing time with them for something else and vice versa. So for me, it's just been about to the best of my ability, figuring out what I can live with and what I can't. And hoping that what I can live with today, I'll be okay with five years from now too. I don't know. But I hope. Yeah. Um, what is your degree in, and how do you hey, wait, believe wait. that? Get the microphone, please. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your degree in, and how do you believe that it advanced your career or helped you become oh. who you are today? So, my undergrad degree was in French literature and government. Uh, my master's was in public policy and my PhD was in education. And I don't know that any of that helped advance my career, to be honest with you. <laughs> I think that what all of those things taught me was how to think. That I think helped advance my career. I think the most important thing for me was figuring out how to be able to talk about how I think and to be able to connect different things together. I think that's been the most important thing. But sometimes even that's a hard sell for people, right? I think sometimes you major in something and people say, oh, you're like this. And then you say, well, sometimes, but not always. And yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you going to prepare your children for college and help them select? Your God. <laughs> <sighs> well. So my son's going to start high school next year, and as my father and my husband can attest, I'm, I'm fairly stressed about that, to put it mildly. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, I think the most important thing is I really want, I mean, they actually, both my kids already kind of think they know where they want to go, which is interesting. Um, my daughter wants to go to Stanford, and she would like for her brother to go along with her. So she has, she has a plan to figure out how he's going to get into Stanford so then she can get there two years later. Um, my son, I don't know that he has sort of a name. I think he's looking for a certain kind of experience, right? He wants to, he, he wants to be independent. Um, you know, his struggle right now is he wants all the independence without any of the responsibility. So I'm hoping we can move him along more on the responsibility continuum. Um, I, I, what, I, what I tell him is what I really want is for him to learn skills. I don't really care about content. I really want for him to learn skills. And what I worry about in terms of school is I feel like so much of it is driven by content. Um, and he is really stubborn and he doesn't really like to study. He likes to learn. He doesn't like to study. And um, I think that makes school really hard for him at different times. And, and I'm a rule follower and he is too, but that's a rule he doesn't want to follow. So, <laughs> you know, we struggle in terms of that because me as a kid, if someone said, do this, I would do it. I might talk for hours about why do I have to do it, but I would still do it. He, he's like my husband in that he'll say, okay, and then he won't do it. <laughs> so he looks like he's going to follow. He goes, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> and then he does something else, right? Which sort of drives me crazy. But, um, you know, my hope is actually, I joke about, I want to take my kids to live for a summer in Detroit um, because 
So my husband is all keen on this. My daughter less so. She's been most vocal about, I don't like this idea at all. Because um, I feel like they live in Irvine. They have everything here. Everything. They have no sense of any sort of, you know, challenge. I mean, even weather-wise, there's, you know, there's no challenge at all in the environment. And so as much as I think they appreciate what they have, they don't have a contrast. Part of what I think I learned so much from was having contrasts, right? So I try and think about how can I create contrasts for them, right? So we've said, oh, you know, I've said, okay, I want us to go live in Detroit for a summer. We'll rent an apartment. We'll all work minimum wage jobs. And my daughter looked at me and said, I'll be staying with, you know, your parents. I, I'm not going. And I was like, really? She said, yeah, I hope you don't miss me too much. And I was like, oh, you'll be coming. So, yeah. But I don't know yet, to be honest. Okay, yeah. yeah, I was wondering about that. How come you haven't traveled with your family as much as your family traveled with you? You know, we have. We go away. We, we travel every summer. Um, and more recently, we've done different kinds of travel. So before, we used to always just travel to Spain. And part of that was because my sister lived in Spain. Um, and yeah. You know, it was the only time we could all be together. And so we would go, and people were always like, oh, that's so exotic. And it was like, not really. We're, you know, we just have lunch as a family and go to the pool. We could be doing that anywhere, but we're all together. Um, after my sister moved to the United States, moved back to the US, we've tried to do different things with the kids so that they're exposed to things. But, you know, two weeks vacationing is not living somewhere, right? Um, and I think the world that I grew up in and the work that my dad did allowed for us to uproot in ways that just couldn't do. I mean, even I think about, you know, in my mind as a kid when we would move, I never knew we were moving until a week before we moved. Maybe I wasn't paying attention, but, you know, all my memories were like, we're leaving for here, to, you know, at the end of the week. Say goodbye to your friends. Oh, okay. I'm sure my parents, right, obviously talked with the teachers and had everything set up. But I didn't have a sense of like, oh, my God, in three months we're moving. No idea. We just got up and went. Um, I don't think you could do that today. You couldn't show up at a school and say, my kids are going to be here for six months. And, you know. I just don't think it works that way. We were able to do that. We'd go live in places most of the times we never knew where we were going to live until we physically arrived there. So someone might have set up something for us temporarily, right? And then we'd have a couple of weeks and my parents would find a place. I don't, I don't know that you can do that as easily anymore. Maybe you need to have a lot of resources. I don't know. I don't know. OK. Well. There may be more questions, but please come on up and ask. Yeah. Thank and you. Language, one is that the second is that uh, we skip December, but we will come back online in January, January 14th. As usual, the second Wednesday of the month, uh, Dark Bander in the School of Biological Sciences will be here. And finally, let's thank Natalie for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.